Well, welcome everybody to the uh, 2023 GADMAC conference. Um, it brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. The title of our next presentation is No Pets Left Behind, a case for aquatic animal evacuation plans. Uh, this is presented by Christine Parker Graham and uh, welcome Christine, we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, I just want to start with a few pieces of housekeeping. Uh, the Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so if you've got any questions, please put those into the Q&A at any point. We'll try and get to those at the end of the session. Um, we have enabled the multilingual closed captions function. So if you need help with translation, please look at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that and select um, a language if you need some help with translation. We encourage you to use the um, hashtag GADMACConf uh, for Twitter and social media and let the world know that we're out here and uh, trying to do our best for people and animals um, in disasters and emergencies. Um, just a quick reminder, we will be recording. We are recording this session and we will be making these uh, recordings available later on uh, as quickly as we can. So without further ado, I'd just like to welcome Christine to GADMAC 23 and uh, kick, let you kick off. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you everyone uh, for being here. Um, I've got some big shoes to step into after that Chernobyl dogs presentation. So I will do my best. Um, my name is Christine Parker Graham. I am currently a veterinary medical officer with the Pacific Region Fish Health Program, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, a lot of the work that I'm gonna be presenting today um, was actually done while I was an aquatic animal health fellow at UC Davis Veterinary School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, so I'd like to pause before I get really started and acknowledge uh, my colleagues, my co-fellows, um, faculty advisors who were really instrumental in pulling this project together. Um, so June Ong, Eva, Quijano, uh, Eva Marie Cujano Carde, uh, Linda Divanek, uh, Matt Stone, John Madigan, Monica Alleman, and our uh, supervisor Esteban Soto. Um, every one of these people had a really um, instrumental part in bringing together not only the ability to evacuate fish from wildfire zones at very short notice, um, but really perfecting our technique and getting that technique out and published. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting on no pets left behind and trying to make a case for everyone uh, to have aquatic animal evacuation plans in place. Um, so this story of plan really goes back to 2017 um, in California. As I mentioned, we were all at UC Davis at this time, and UC Davis is in the very northern part of the Central Valley of California, so is considered Northern California, um, and we're kind of San Francisco Bay Area adjacent in Davis, um, and at the time in 2017, um, if you're familiar at all with the Western United States and the ecology, a lot of our natural ecology in the Western U.S. is heavily based on wildfire, Unfortunately, we have a lot of development in interface areas throughout the Western United States. So that really critical wildfire component of the ecology of the Western US and Western Canada, as you've probably seen on the news recently, um, has become very dangerous because of the um, expansion of human settlement into these areas. Uh, so the map of California on the left there, you can see where Davis is starred, kind of in the northern half of the state. And all of those outlines um, of the regions that are outlined in black there were active fire zones um, in October of 2017. And you can see on the map on the right there, that was taken from the International Space Station in October, um, showing some of the smoke plumes from these fires. To give you an idea of how much of the state was involved in these fires at the time, um, so much so that it has since adopted the name just the 2017 firestorm of Northern California. Um, so as I mentioned, we're very used to fire in California. We're all adapted to it. We all know our house of we all know works on fourth of things like that. And um, for, for a very long time, it has been accepted that wildfire was something that happened in wildlands. If you lived in suburban areas or cities, this wasn't really a concern um, that you necessarily had. And in 2017, we saw that script flip 180 degrees. Um, so in October in Northern California, um, the firestorm got so bad and so widespread so quickly that uh, wildfires actually got into areas like suburban areas in Santa Rosa, um, which is a fairly moderate sized city in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so you can see on the right there, this is a 
typical suburban neighborhood um, in Santa Rosa that was burned over. We saw very similar burnovers in Napa and the rest of Sonoma County, where areas that we don't usually consider fire danger at all um, were decimated by these fires. And in the course of this, the, our veterinary emergency response team um, was called in by the incident command system to help evacuate um, animals ranging from livestock to, of course, companion animals. Um, we were evacuating animals from fire zones as well as helping care for animals that had showed up with their owners at uh, fire evacuation shelters. And so this is a pretty typical picture of what the Veterinary Emergency Response Team, or VERT, does during the summer and fall in California, is taking care of livestock, helping people with cats and dogs, um, and maybe even caged pets. And um, so these are all protocols that are in place. Everyone's really familiar with dealing with these species. As you can see, a lot of our fire crews in California are trained to handle these animals under um, extenuating circumstances. And so it's not unusual that if you're out on the fire line, a firefighter will bring you a lamb or a dog or a goat that they've found. Um, and that has just become part of the wildfire scene in California in recent years. However, because of the involvement of these really unconventional suburban neighborhoods in 2017, um, we got some very unusual calls. Um, and our calls were about fish in the fire zones. And so typically fire zones pre-2007 were rural areas, people living deep in the interface and deep into wildlands. So not typically places that you would associate with ornamental koi ponds or ornamental fish structures on properties. However, once these fires got into suburban areas, um, they were involving a whole new aspect of animal involvement that we hadn't prepared for before. Um, so at the time I was an aquatic animal fellow at UC Davis, and we got a late night call from our veterinary emergency response team out in the field that they had been approached by uh, sheriffs, the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department, who were driving through neighborhoods to assess damage, look for hot spots, um, make sure that people were staying safe as they came in to evaluate the damage to their homes and property. And in the course of that, the sheriff came across a koi pond that had amazingly live fish in it. And you can see from this picture that the neighborhood um, was largely destroyed by this, this specific neighborhood was largely destroyed in the fire. So it was really amazing um, that the, he came across this pond with live fish. And he asked, he's like, oh, I don't really know the fish are alive. They seem to be doing okay. Uh, is this something I should worry about? Should I leave the fish? Should I evacuate the fish? And of course, our response is evacuate those fish if we can. Um, so when we get these fires like this, our main concern with these ponds is um, that we lost the life support systems for the pond. So we've lost filtration, we've lost temperature control, we've lost oxygen flow. So hypoxia is our greatest risk or just the complete dissolution of oxygen from the water. And this is kind of twofold. Not only do we have pumps recirculating oxygen through the water, um, but in a lot of these cases, we got a lot of ash and soot across the top of the water, floating on top of the water that formed kind of a cover over the water. So no oxygen was able to naturally diffuse into the water column. And we were worried about some of that ash being toxic because these are burning through residential areas. We've got a lot of petroleum-based chemicals in there. We've got a lot of stuff that we're not really sure what the origin is that can leach into the water and kill these fish. We also worry about waste accumulation. Some of these ponds that they came across did have dead fish in them, which is going to be a risk of um, disease and just putting waste products into the water that those fish net might not be able to deal with without active filtration systems. And of course, we were really worried about temperature change and what was gonna happen um, now that all the temperature control of the pond was gone. So our recommendation was absolutely get those fish out of there. And when they asked us how to get those fish out of there, we didn't really know. Um, we had never done this before. We'd never attempted large scale fish evacuations, um, but the veterinary emergency response team jumped right in. What you can't see in these pictures is you can't see the Sonoma County Sheriff's deputy in fishing waders off to the side using livestock panels to herd these fish into the shallow areas of the pond so that they could be netted out. Um, and the uh, the news outlet in San Jose, California said it perfectly when they called this a MacGyver-like rescue of koi fish. Um, that's exactly what it was. It was a very um, cobbled together approach to get these fish out and to get them somewhere safe. 
And what this showed to us is we definitely need a case for preparedness. Um, so this was something that, um, you know, with the increase of fire activity, the increase of fire activity in suburban areas, the spread of fire activity spatially, um, this probably was not going to be the first time that we were going to be called on to evacuate koi ponds. Um, so we did it, we MacGyvered it, um, and in the course of this, it, it became very apparent a better plan for the future. So before we even talk fish, um, we'll touch on the, the human aspects of this, and you'll probably hear this a lot throughout this conference. I have the benefit of going early on, so hopefully you haven't heard this too much yet. Um, but number one um, of everything that we talk about on the human dimension of this is to never self-deploy. I know as animal lovers and animal handlers and rescuers and veterinarians, we want to jump in. We see animals that need help. We know we can help and we want to get out there. Um, but never self-deploy. Um, always wait for a mobilization call from an existing incident command system leadership. And that usually comes through the form of um, state organized veterinary corps or um, nonprofit organized animal rescue teams. And so if you are interested in helping, definitely get hooked up with one of those groups. That's going to be the safest, most organized and most effective way to become involved in evacuations and rescue. Um, once you're there, always work within the existing ICS or incident command system structure. Um, that is an international, very well proven. I think we've got 45, 50 years of evidence showing that ICS works. It's very clear. It's very organized. And so when you show up um, to an event, your organizational unit will be placed within ICS and you'll have a very, very clear uh, chain of leadership and chain of communication. So always follow that. Um, when you're on site, of course, always follow directions from first responders and ICS commanders on site. Um, working in evacuation areas is very fluid and very dynamic, um, particularly in these fire areas. We were going into active fire zones to get these fish out with the acknowledgement that conditions can change very quickly. And we may get a call on the radio that is get out immediately, drop what you're doing and leave. And so you have to be um, always wary of those kinds of changes around you and always have good communication with your first responders on site. Um, human safety is paramount in these situations. Um, you know, you're going into a dangerous situation that's physically and emotionally taxing. And I know we wanna throw 110% into our project right out of the gate, um, but it's really important to acknowledge that if you're not taking care of yourself and your team isn't taking care of themselves, you're not going to be the best version of helpers to show up. Um, so always watch for human safety and be vigilant of physical and emotional fatigue, not just for yourself, but for people around you. Um, this, you know, it does take an emotional toll, seeing this kind of destruction and being face to face with people who've lost their homes, um, have potentially lost pets or don't know where their pets are. It's incredibly confusing. It's, it's heart wrenching and you know we are showing up to help. Um, and so a lot of that you will be seen as a helper. And so you may be confronted with people um, who just need help. They wanna talk, um, they want answers and that can be emotionally very fatiguing. Um, so again, maintain communication with your team lead throughout the incident for all of these physical, emotional fatigue issues. Anything like that should be communicated up your chain of command. Um, and then lastly, this is a little fish specific, but really be aware of the species that you're handling and any legal restrictions on transport, particularly if you're moving across state lines or um, jurisdictional lines and things like that. Some of these species can be seen as injurious wildlife, like um, koi and goldfish in some districts, um, because if they are released or they do happen to make their way into a natural water body, um, they can do a lot of damage to native species. Um, so always be really aware that while in our minds we're transporting fish and we're rescuing fish, you may have um, local or regional regulations on transporting these animals to be aware of. So now we can get into fish. Um, so a lot of people are pretty unfamiliar with fish and it's probably the last 10 years that fish medicine has really gotten a foothold um, within the wider community of veterinary medicine. So there are more and more practitioners that are more familiar with um, fish medicine, but it's still definitely not a mainstream field of practice. And uh, most people are going to have to brush up um, before they go on a fish evacuation um, or call one of your fish colleagues. Um, we love fish. If we, those of us who practice with fish love them. We're always happy to talk. We're always happy to provide support wherever we can. Um, but the basic principles of 
fish medicine, um, number one is that fish are a direct reflection of their environment. So we can take most animals, most of our companion animals especially, out of their environment and they can do okay. A dog in the home, a dog in a shelter, um, they're of course going to experience some stress, but overall it's, it's going to be fairly limited we can't really take fish out of their environment. They need to stay in water. We need to move them in water. And because they are so intimately tied to their environment, their health and well-being is a direct reflection of the health and um, the health of their environment. Uh, stress results in really profound immune suppression in fish, um, particularly chronic stress. And chronic for fish is usually over a couple of days. Uh, most fish disease that we're going to be dealing with is secondary to environment. Um, the fish do tolerate change better than acute change. So fish that undergo acute changes, like these fish that are in fire zones, um, they are going to be stressed. They're experiencing a lot of environmental degradation. And so they are really gonna be at risk of secondary um, health problems and secondary infections. Um, and lastly, biosecurity is a really integral part of fish health management. And biosecurity is um, one of those things that I think we uh, do think about as veterinarians, but in a situation where you're rushed and it's emergency, biosecurity can kind of fall to the wayside as we're just trying to get animals out and get them to safety. Um, but for fish, it's really important to consider that biosecurity is part of getting them to safety. Um, and at the end, evacuation, even the best planned, best executed, most beautiful evacuation that you can perform, will challenge all of these principles. Um, and so this is just to say, be prepared to deal with and mitigate these problems. Um, but in a realistic, practical way, there's no way that you're going to eliminate all of these from the list. So the first um, challenge is handling and transport. So like I mentioned, fish can't be removed from their environment. So you're moving the environment along with the fish. Um, and that environment is water which is incredibly heavy, it's incredibly unwieldy, um, and it is gonna take a lot more space in water than it is with your patients. Um, so you do need to prepare for that. Um, in our case, we were transporting fish anywhere from about 112 to 140 kilometers from the fire zone to get them back to Davis where we could safely house them. And this was pretty slow going. As you can imagine, we were driving on roads that were also being used by first responders, which of course absolutely have the right of way um, to get where they need to go. We're driving on roads where signaling is often out because of electrical outages. There may be downed power lines or downed trees on the roadway that we have to uh, navigate. And so that 140 kilometer trip, which usually may take us an hour and a half or so, um, was taking three to four hours. Um, we were also making these trips with a really heavily loaded truck. Um, so we used um, 100 gallon livestock feed or water containers, which is about 370 liters. So you can think about 370 uh, kilos being added into the back of a pickup truck. Um, so we had to consider, A, can the pickup trucks even hold this kind of load? Um, a lot of the pickup trucks that we were using and SUVs that we were using originally could not. Um, so we had to have someone who was set up to tow uh, large livestock trailers come out and give us a hand. And then we also had to be really cognizant that that much weight in the back of these trucks really changed how the trucks handled. They really increased our braking time and our ability to speed up. And in emergency road situations like this, this was a really, really um, important concept for our very excellent drivers um, to take into account right away. Um, so the first real takeaway point, um, and this may be the most important takeaway point, is to respect the slime. Um, so fish have what we call a mucus cuticle, which is um, exactly what it sounds like. It's a slime coat or a mucus coat that sits right on top of the um, epidermis. So it's what's in contact with the fish's environment most immediately. And this cuticle is essential for immune function. So it's really the first innate immune defense. Um, so it stops pathogens from attaching. Um, it stops parasites from attaching. It blocks any osmoregulatory movement of electrolytes in and out of the fish. It's really rich in things like antimicrobial peptides and lysozymes, lectins, proteases. You name it, the mucus coat probably has it. 
it does regenerate constantly. Um, so these fish from their goblet cells in the skin are always producing mucus and pushing it up to the epidermis, but it is prone to acute trauma. And acute trauma to the mucus cuticle typically happens um, with things like rough handling or abrasive, sub abrasive substrates, abrasive nets, and things like that. And while it does regenerate, if you damage that mucus cuticle, that's going to form small micro windows in which pathogens can attack the fish that's already going to be stressed. Um, there are a lot of over-the-counter products um, that are available that can be added to water that are um, like uh, different kinds of polypeptides and polymers that can help protect and rebuild that mucus coat. And so those are really widely available at pet stores and pond supply stores. Um, they're really easy to pick up. I didn't put a picture in here for the sake of inadvertently promoting one over the other. Um, they're all really good and you can get them in, you know, one ounce bottles all the way up to one gallon um, containers if this is something that you're interested in being involved in. Um, so the second, and this goes along with respecting the slime, um, are these knotted nylon nets. Um, this is what everyone has. This is what people use for fishing. Um, it's what a lot of people use on their own ponds. So when we went into our MacGyver phase to get these fish out, these knotted nets are what we mostly encountered and they're terrible. They do not respect the slime. Um, moreover, a lot of the fish that we were pulling out are ornamental species with really beautiful long fins, and those can get tangled in these nets and cause some pretty severe damage. Um, so we recommend these sock nets that are to the side here. They're super smooth. They're very soft inside. You actually catch the fish along with water. So ideally, the fish isn't contacting the side of the net at all, and they can just swim free from the pond to the net to the transport container. Um, and then, of course, always wear gloves to protect yourself and to protect the fish. And we really like the non-powdered nitrile gloves because that's not going to introduce any particulates that could be potentially dangerous into the water. Um, so here's what we rigged up. You can see we've got a nice beefy truck that somebody lent to us. Um, and we actually have two of those 100 gallon stock tanks in the back there. Um, so several hundred additional pounds sitting in the back of that truck. Um, we really like the opaque containers so the fish aren't being visually stressed while they're in transport. Um, and then definitely a solid covers that covers the entire top. And um, we had a really ingenious uh, vert member who suggested bicycle pumps as a way to supply oxygen to the water column when we were transporting these fish. Um, so these are 12 volt uh, bicycle pumps that actually hooked right into the cigarette lighter in the truck um, and supplied the fish with air during the entire transport. Um, so a, a couple other things to keep in mind, um, is it considering the water source for transport? Ideally, we'd fill these um, livestock water troughs up with water from the fish's pond if it was safe enough to do that, um, wow. just in order to eliminate some of the variables like temperature changes and chemical balance changes that could stress out the fish. Um, some of those ponds that there were so foul that wasn't possible. So we did find a source where we could get well water to uh, fill the troughs, which was really nice. If you are using municipal water, um, you may have to use a dechlorination product. Um, a lot of municipal water is treated with chlorine and chloramines at levels that aren't really that big of a deal for us and other mammals, um, but can be toxic and actually lethal to fish. Um, so keep in mind, if you're using municipal water, you may also need to carry a dechlorination product in addition to that slime coat product. Um, and then also consider any waste products that may be in that water. Um, so in our case, we were using well water and we were pretty nervous. Um, you know, was there firefighting foam residuals in that water? Is there ash? Is there runoff in that water um, that has made it down to the well? Um, we luckily did not encounter that, but it is something to be cognizant of. Um, be cognizant of your transport time. It's going to take you longer than you think it will um, with a fully loaded truck and fish in the back. And it, when you're thinking transport time, um, the main variable you want to think is dissolved oxygen. That's the most important variable of keeping fish alive is having adequate dissolved oxygen for them to respire in the water. Um, and that is helped along by stocking density. So our nature is we want to put all the fish in the truck at once. We want to get them out of here. Um, but we had to be really careful that we weren't stocking our tanks, our rescue tanks, uh, so densely that they would use up all the oxygen that was available and end up suffocating. 
Um, we also had to be really careful of temperature change. So we were transporting at night, which was um, nice because it was a fairly um, even temperature across transport. But if you're transporting during the daytime in the sun, those opaque tanks can heat up pretty quickly. And as the water warms up, it's going to hold less oxygen. So warmer water is going to stress out fish. They're going to use more oxygen. And then warmer water is just naturally going to hold less oxygen. And then again, water is really heavy and you need it. You can't transport fish around it. So this is just a very unfortunate reality um, that you're transporting a lot of very heavy water with you um, when you're evacuating fish. Um, so challenge number two is housing. Um, these aren't animals that we can bring in and put into a stall or put into a cage and wait for their owners to come and take them home. Um, these are fish that are, or these are animals that are probably gonna require fairly long-term, fairly intense housing situations. Um, again, be cognizant of the water source when you're housing these fish and chlorine levels in that, those water sources. Um, water quality is really important. And in emergency situations, you know, we don't need to get down to brass tacks of like heavy metals and um, ammonia waste in the, prod, in the water and things like that. Um, but the two that we really do want to match as closely as possible to the home water or the transport water is temperature and pH. Um, and so if you can match that as closely as possible with the housing water, that's going to make your fish patients acclimation a lot easier. Um, and then, of course, biosecurity. Biosecurity is tough in these situations, particularly if you're rescuing fish from multiple ponds and bringing them all on site to one place. Um, it's very, very easy for biosecurity to break down, especially in these stressful kind of like high speed situations. Um, but biosecurity is really important to keeping fish healthy um, throughout their stay with you. Um, one of the big challenges is what we call new tank syndrome. Um, and because we're often evacuating these animals on short notice, um, it's impractical to expect that we've had tanks set up, the tanks have been beautifully cycled, they have all of the nitrogen cycle bacteria necessary to maintain good water quality and things like that. Um, most of the tanks are set up while the rescuers are out in the field getting the fish. Um, so some of the water quality things to expect are um, there's going to be no bacteria present in those tanks to break down um, waste products that the fish are going to excrete, primarily ammonia. Uh, so ammonia is going to be one of those figures that you do have to keep a really close eye on um, in those initial days of housing these animals. It's highly toxic to fish. And unfortunately, it takes a very small concentration of ammonia to start causing fish health problems. Um, so the way that we got around this is we did constant flow through through the tanks. Um, so no water was really sitting in the tank without being cycled. And so if that's a possibility for you, that is a fantastic way to um, get around this problem. Other options are like um, either seeding the tank while you're waiting for the fish to show up with something like bleach so you can get those ammonia bacteria running. Uh, charcoal or carbon filters are really good at filtering out ammonia as well. Um, but again, keeping an eye on this um, in your housing or evacuation area is gonna be really important. Um, challenge number three is stress. Um, it's all stressful for fish from start to finish. They've lost their home. They've gone through a pretty catastrophic loss of water support systems. They've probably gone through a pretty catastrophic temperature or thermocline as the fire burned over them. Um, they're, and then they're dealing with transport and they're dealing with housing on new water sources and a new environment. And if we think about the ecological role of fish, almost all fish, unless you're like a whale shark or a white shark, you're going to be food for someone else. So these are animals that are um, very sensitive to stress just naturally. And when we put them through these very unnatural situations, this can really compound both the acute and chronic stress response. Um, you can reduce stressors wherever possible, like optimizing the environment, providing them a good diet when they're acclimated, um, doing salt treatments with the water to reduce osmoregulatory stress. Um, but just be really cognizant. You're not going to, uh, you know, erase all of the stressors that these animals are experiencing. And with stress comes secondary disease, unfortunately. And so you can see on the pictures here, um, these were fish that we rescued in 2017, and they showed up in pretty good condition, all things considered. Um, and then a couple of days after being housed, they broke out with this really severe parasitic infection um, that we highly suspect was due to the stress that they had experienced. 
Um, bacterial infections are really, really common in these situations as well. Um, and then viral infections are important. Um, and this is where biosecurity plays in um, really importantly, is you can get the development of new viral back or new viral infections, which, you know, good biosecurity, that's not going to be that common. Um, but recrudescence of pre-existing um, viral infections is really common in these stressful situations. Um, so you may have fish that look well, and then a couple of days, they're going to break out with signs of viral disease um, just from a latent virus that they've carried for several years. Um, and then, of course, trauma um, was is always a consideration here. The fish are going to be um, banging themselves into the side of the tank, trying to get acclimated to their new environment and things like that. So trauma is always something to be on the lookout for. Christine, um, so could I just interrupt momentarily and just ask you to try to um, wrap up, please? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Okay, um, so I'll actually um, jump through this disease stuff is um, getting into the weeds. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that there is a lot of public support for this. So when we headed into this, we were like, oh, gosh, what do we do with these fish? Um, and then in our social, this was put on the social media for the university, and there was massive, massive public support for this and really showed um, to us that people's fish are really important to them and rescuing these fish was really important to getting their owners um, back to a sense of um, feeling home or back to a sense of stability and possession that they had lost in the fires. Um, so here's a fish evacuation kit um, for if you're watching this later and can pause the video. Um, the key takeaways, again, environment, environment, environment. Um, water quality are really important for these animals. Um, always respect that slime code as much as you can. Um, do what you can to reduce stress. Always be thinking biosecurity and how you can make the environment as biosecure as possible. Um, and then, of course, reach out to your fish colleagues at any time. There's tons of species of fish. There's tons of ways of housing them. Um, tons of different pref environmental preferences that these animals have. Um, and really the easiest way to get to the bottom of this is just reach out to someone um, either in a local koi club, a local pond store owner, a local veterinarian that sees fish, fish hobbyists. Um, they're always, always happy to help out, um, especially in these kinds of times and do what they can for um, their other fish owning colleagues. Um, so this is my email address. Please feel free to email me um, if you do have any questions or want any more information. Um, and we have published these guidelines in the Journal of the American uh, Veterinary Medicine Association, or JAVMA. Um, so this article is available open source on their website. Um, and if you can't access it, I'm happy to send it to you. It has all these guidelines in detail, um, as well as that supply list and um, some other pointers with the infectious disease aspect. Um, so very happy to share this with anyone who's interested interested. Um, and then lastly, this is just to show it was a massive group effort. Um, so just a thanks to everyone who helped out um, from the sheriff who found the fish, all the way up to the Center for Aquatic Biology at Davis who helped us house these fish and the students who took care of these fish while they were staying with us. Thank you. If you can just stop sharing for us, that'd be great. Uh, sorry to have to have uh, rushed you off at the last few minutes, Christine. That was a, a fabulously sort of comprehensive view of, of a very different kind of world, I think, for many people that are uh, involved mostly with the terrestrial sort of beasts and, and in my case, pets. Um, so thank you so much for all that information. And um, maybe we can look at how we could um, promote some of these uh, references and, and our articles that uh, our speakers are uh, mentioning in their presentations, perhaps we can host those on the website and, uh, and do the same for Jennifer, the previous speaker.